Welcome to Stories of Hope. I'm Christine Hotchkiss. Each week I bring you stories of inspiration, education, and stories of hope that will definitely change you. I want to say thank you to my studio sponsor, the Motivated Mind Group, your local creative agency. Where do you turn for help when you are dying and the doctors can't figure out why you are sick? Well, today my guest Marilyn Hammer is going to give us that answer. She wrote this book, Over My Dead Body, and it talks about being a survivor of Lyme disease. Please help me welcome my guest today, Marilyn. Thank welcome, you. Marilyn. Thank you. We met um, at a function not too long ago, and I'd heard about your story, and then recently I was at a film festival where I'd learned about Lyme disease, and um, the movie was, a, it was actually a documentary, and the documentary was The Monster Within Me, and I thought, the monster within me was not what I thought it was going to be and started seeing it. And then you came to my mind knowing about your book. So I'm glad that you took me up on my offer to come in here and talk about it more so that I can understand it. And anyone else that knows about Lyme disease or knows someone about this journey will be educated too. So you, we all know that Lyme disease is, been, is from a tick. Yes. So tell me where this all began that, I mean, the woods, I mean, where, what happened? Where were you? Uh, I was in Hilton Head okay. and I was at a conference and they had the reception outside and we were getting eaten alive by bugs. I had no idea that I had a tick bite. I'm from Montana and the ticks in Montana are sticking out of your skin. Mm. And there was nothing like that. I had no bullseye, I had no uh, rash, which are typical, well about 40% of the people get those things when they get bit by a tick. So I had no idea, and it took six and a half years to diagnose me. Wow. I went from being a world-class athlete, I was a, an extreme skier, and I went from that to I couldn't walk up a flight of stairs. That's crazy. And I went to doctor after doctor, and nobody had answers. And so it took six and a half years to find a diagnosis. What are the symptoms that you would say that you they didn't even know you were sick. I mean, obviously we go to the doctor, we have a cold, there's well, gotta they, be something. They knew I was sick, they just didn't know what it was. And my primary care physician is from Hawaii. Okay. So he, he had no experience with Lyme disease. Okay. And they teach very little about it in medical school. So most doctors have no idea. It goes di undiagnosed or wrong diagnosis most of the time. So I went from doctor to doctor to doctor, and then one day I had a three-hour intake with a clinic, and there was a doctor that asked to sit in. He was there filling out his personnel paperwork, and he hadn't even started to work for the, um, the company yet, but he asked if he could sit in on my case. And about 20 minutes into the interview, he said, I know exactly what you have, but keep going. And it was a huge questionnaire, and at at the end of the doctors asking questions, he said, can you feel your feet? And I said, no. <laughs> really? And he said, why didn't you put that on your questionnaire? And I said, well, they've, they've been numb for so long that I didn't think about it. Interesting. And he said, do you have a headache? And I said, yes. And he said, is it like a migraine? And I said, yes. He said, how long have you had it? And I said, probably about five years. And he said, why didn't you put that on your <laughs> questionnaire? And I said, I, I've had it so long I don't think about it. Um, and so there was a lot of things like that. I had floaters in my eyes, um, neurological issues, um, what they call foggy thinking, where one minute you can remember everything and the next minute it's like, what's the name of this? You know, it, it's, uh, and you can't recall the name that it's a cup or whatever yeah, it is. and it's something very common and they call it foggy thinking. Okay. Um, my arms were going numb, uh, my feet were numb, and, and I was getting weaker and I, I was a world-class athlete going into it. So um, that was very hard on me because I was working out and getting weaker and weaker. And so he said, you have Lyme disease. Interesting. And I, and I didn't know much about it, so I had to go and research it. I, I'm big on research. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the hardest, mm. the hardest part about it was because my daughter was five years old, and 
she also had it. And when he started asking me questions, he said, um, when did you get hypothyroidism? And I said, in 2001, and he said, where were you the year before that? And then I remembered the spite on my leg that I had for months. And I, I even remember emailing a friend of mine that was at the same conference, and he said, um, I said, what's up with the bites in Hilton Head? And I still had a hole in my leg like four months later. And, um, and that's how we figured out how long I had had it. And then he said, your daughter needs to be tested. Now, how did your daughter get it? In utero. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Lyme is a spirochete, and which is the same pathogen as syphilis. Mm. So a lot of doctors say that it's not, you can't pass it in utero or sexually transmitted or anything like that, but syphilis is, is transmitted all those ways. And my daughter had Lyme disease. I was bit by the same month that I, with, that I got pregnant. So she was born with it. So you didn't know when she was born that she had it until you mentioned she was five. So obviously something came about that said, we need to get your daughter checked as well. Was there symptoms well, all along in those five years you didn't realize were related to the Lyme disease? Yeah, I had no idea. Wow. I mean, she, she wasn't as severe as I was. Mm -hmm. However, she, she was tired all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, she was having difficulties learning. She had cognitive challenges. Okay. Um, and, you know, at five, she was in kindergarten, and, and a lot of it is like sight words and basic math that they have to just memorize, mm -hmm. and she couldn't retain it. Interesting. And, and she was very tired, but I, I kept her active, so I had her in dance, I had her in gymnastics, but she would do an exercise, and then she would have to lay down and take a nap. Um, and, and so it was really hard on her you know, even at that young age. So yeah. now, I got a chance to read the back of the book. I haven't had a chance to go through the entire book. So I have a few questions, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, just because I want to make sure that we are giving the right information if anyone has questions on it, um, like myself. You've already talked about how um, it was in, in utero. It was, we all know it's about a tick. Um, there weren't really any symptoms to understand how this even was what they identified it to be at first. Um, what treatments did you both go under, or undergo, excuse me? Well, my treatments were quite a bit different than Elizabeth's um, because of her age. Mm -hmm. And the severity of the infection, I had a lot more symptoms than she had. And um, so, when they first started, the, the same month I was diagnosed, the NIH came out with a report saying that latent chronic Lyme don't exist. Interesting. And the Connecticut Attorney General took them to court and proved that their report was invalid because it was written by four doctors who had never treated later chronic Lyme disease. And it, he won the case. And, it, and it's interesting you would say that because in this movie that I had seen, or this documentary I had seen over the weekend, they were going to the CDC, asking them, why aren't you taking note of this? This is a real thing. And the calls that were being recorded, they were just continuously denying anything or didn't even want to give the time of day to these individuals to say, hey, we've got another thing out here that we need some help on. Yeah. So I find that quite interesting. And I don't understand why, and I'm not going to try and go there. But obviously, there is something there. But it's still yeah. an underlining of what and why it's not being acknowledged. In the meantime, you've got many people that are going through this journey without understanding what their journey is or the treatments yeah. and if they're going to live because you had a near-death experience as well. Yeah, that was from a blood infection from the IV port. So when, when they started treating me, I was getting about 12 IVs a week. Um, I was getting two injections a week of, um, of antibiotics and I had 104 fever for about six months. Six months? Six months. Um, when you kill Lyme disease, it, it releases massive amounts of neurotoxins. And so your body has to process all of those toxins out and it causes fevers, runny nose, like they call it Herxheimer's reaction. And oh. it's miserable. 
And when he first diagnosed me, he said, the treatments for Lyme disease is not for dummy, or not for, not dummies. <laughs> 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 not for sissies. <laughs> um, and he said, you're gonna have days that you can't walk, there's gonna be days that you can't talk, and there's gonna be days that you just wanna die. <gasps> and he was right. Oh, well now, when you, and you hear people say the phrase, I just wanna die, but you said you feel that way. Was that a physical feeling that you were like, I just don't want to deal with the pain or the tiredness? What does yeah. that mean? Well, I was a single mom and my daughter was five and I own my own business. So I was also still having to travel and work during all of this. And there was days, I, mean, I was making her lunch one morning before school and I collapsed and I couldn't walk. And I had hired a nanny and she and my daughter took me to the clinic and Wow. And they did IVs, and, um, and, and there was days when I would be in Washington. I worked in higher ed, and I would go up on the hill and do visits, and there was days when the bellman carried me to my room after doing visits. Just it, it was brutal. Just to try and find the strength to just literally get up every day mm -hmm. and do a function and then take care of another individual as well. Yeah. Oh. So, so my... My treatments were more progressive. Um, with my daughter, we did a lot of hyperbaric chamber um, oxygen treatments because pathogens don't live well in an oxygen-rich environment. Okay. So she and the nanny and I would go into the hyperbaric chamber and read books and do her homework. And, and um, you know, she just wanted to be a normal kid and it was very hard on her. Oh, wow. Um, and so we, we went through different um, treatments, uh, a total of three years of treatments. And I had an IV port because 12 IVs a week wore out my veins pretty quickly. I bet. Um, and that's how I got the blood infection. And we also had figured out that I, I was using an energetic medicine machine. Okay. And so all, there'd be a room of us with IV bags um, and we all had Lyme disease and we'd go in there and and so we were running everybody on these energetic programs and there was um, there was a pattern that everybody had high amounts of mercury mm. the people who were very sick had high mercury amounts for me that made sense because I was I was raised in a mining town so I had a lot of heavy metals so we did things to get rid of the heavy metals um, and everybody was um, getting a hit energetically for tuberculosis hmm. at one point. And, um, but we didn't have full-blown tuberculosis, and this is one of the key things that we figured out. Um, and so I did a six-week treatment of tuberculosis medicine. I was doing injections. My daughter did um, oral. I was going to ask, sentence. I was going to ask, I mean, she's only five and here you're an adult and your body's supposed to be mature to be able to handle all these different things, but yet you said you got tired and then you end up having to have a port because the veins do get tired. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know she, how... She didn't do IVs. Okay. We did energetic medicine, a lot of homeopathic medicines and the um, oxygen chambers. However, with the tuberculosis, we did do oral medication. Okay. And the the pathogens died so in, in such a large amount and so quickly that I actually smelled like a rotting animal. Oh it, my! It was horrific. Um, and we we don't have any scientific studies on it, but what we felt was that the um, tuberculosis was some type of food for the pathogens, and so when we killed the tuberculosis. Um, the the pathogens started dying and like i said it was just massive die-offs and then and you then your body has to process all these like dead bodies of the pathogens did you feel like you were a guinea pig i i was but i was desperate to live mm -hmm. because of my daughter mm -hmm. and um so that much later actually right before i i published the book the CDC came out with a study saying that humans could contract tuberculosis from deer. Oh. 
in December of 2019. Okay. We figured that out in 2007. Goes back on to the documentary that I had watched, and we're not going to attack anything because that's not where we're at, but the recognition that some things people have to go through for them to say, there's a problem and we need to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, so we figured that part out. So we felt a lot better because it had killed a lot of the pathogens. Mm -hmm. And then um, I started getting pain in my arm and I travel tremendous amounts with my work and um, I thought it was tennis elbow or something mm -hmm. at first. And um, then one day they were taking blood out of the port and this white, it looked like styrofoam. Uh, it came in through, they were drawing the blood and it came in through the needle and then in little white chunks and then it grouped together. It looked like a piece of styrofoam. And there was four doctors in the clinic at the time and they're all looking at it and of course, I'm, I'm a smart ass, so I'm like, Is, if that's fat, can we take some out of my butt? <laughs> the easy way. <laughs> Nobody knew what it was. Nobody had seen anything. So they sent the whole syringe to the lab, wow. and it came back fibrin fibrinogen. And biofilm was brand new at that time. They had started studying it. It had been um, discovered, and that's what biofilm is made of is fibrin and fibrinogen. So it was pulling the biofilm out of my veins oh, out wow. through the IV port. And I, I wasn't sure what that meant. I read studies about it, but it was brand new. So I wasn't sure what that meant. And then I was getting sicker and sicker, sicker and I ended up having a blood infection with a 3% survival rate. 3%? Yeah, so I, I, I nearly died. Um, I crossed over numerous times, and um, it's a miracle that I'm alive. I would say so. Um, one of the things that saved me was um, I had one of my therapists that kept saying, you have the same patterns as this woman who died, and they couldn't figure out what my blood infection was because if they took me off of the antibiotics, they thought I would die. Hmm. So they just kept changing the antibiotics. And so finally, I was laying in bed. I was gray. My hair fell out. My intestines were falling out. Um, my body was too weak to even hold my intestines in. And I asked her to contact the man whose wife had died from this blood infection. And they got, he, he was out of town at the time. And he's, this was a Tuesday. And he said, I'll be back on Friday. And she said, I don't think she's going to live that long. So you were, he was referring to you to not live that long. My therapist said she didn't think I would live that long. Those are not words that anyone wants to hear. That's yeah. a scrum. Is that I, I, was, I was laying in bed just praying I wouldn't die. There wasn't an infectious disease doctor in the state of Arizona who would see me. They would start talking to me, and I would tell them I got the blood infection through an IV port, and they, and they had to do emergency surgery to take that out. And... Um, and they said, oh, you have a port because of cancer. And I said, no, I have a port for Lyme disease. And they'd say, we can't see you. And I said, I'm not asking you to treat Lyme disease. I'm asking you to treat my blood infection. And they refused to see me because I had Lyme. I have lots of questions that I would want to ask a doctor <laughs> why they would refuse help when it yeah. comes to something Because like they this. went after doctors for treating Lyme. They, okay. they put them out of business quite often at that point. So, um, so we had to figure it out ourselves. And so she got a hold of this man. He got a hold of his son who went and got his mother's medical records and gave us the name of the infection. And they got me on the right antibiotic. In and the that saved of my time. life. Wow. And then from that time, it was about six weeks before I could walk across a room. So you lost mobility in all this time? I just, I was so weak. I. I could hardly walk. It, it was excruciatingly painful, and I didn't take any um, pain medicine because the level of pain told me whether the antibiotic was working or not. Wow. And, um, and I wanted to be present to be with my daughter. She would come home from school and get up in bed with me, and we'd do homework in bed. And um, it, it, I was very close to dying. Fun functioning? 
knowing that you have this illness and functioning with the thought that you're going to die, that's strong. Yeah. yeah. I, I hear the phrase, oh, you're so strong, and here I'm just saying that's strong. I'm not going to say you're strong because it's something you have to do. It's a determination and a perseverance on what you want as the outcome. And so for that, I commend you mm -hmm. because you had something that you were looking past the situation that you were in. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's not something you just tell everybody, hey, this is what's going on. You're like, no, this is what I need to, to do. Mm -hmm. And not knowing what it is you needed to do to get yeah. better, right? Yeah. So, so from there, um, we felt better because the infection level was lower and she felt better also. And um, that was in September and over Christmas, I, I'm, I'm into health foods and everything, I always have been. And so I was like, we need to get all these antibiotics out of us, we're gonna do a cleanse. Okay. And so I bought, it's called Greens First Cleanse. Mm -hmm. And we both did that over the holidays and we both got very sick again. And I came back to Arizona and went to the doctors and he said, your blood infection is back, which was terrifying. And so he was on the, the phone with a pharmacist trying to figure out what to put me on. And I was reading the research material about the blood infection and it said it had a biofilm. And I just, I stopped and I said, Dr. Susser, it has a biofilm and so does Lyme. Mm -hmm. And I knew there was a connection. And what we figured out was the enzymes from the plants and fruits in the Green's First Cleanse was dissolving the biofilm. And biofilm forms, the pathogens form it to hide in. When your antibiotics leave your body, it comes back out. And so all of these blood infections, sepsis, that's why people die is because it's hiding in the biofilm and then comes back out. That's why it comes back and they're called stealth infections. Okay. So we figured that part out and we did a protocol of enzymes at the same time we were doing the antibiotics. And about a month and a half later, we were both Lyme free and I was blood infection free. So you found it yourself through trial and error, not even knowing you were going through trial and error. Wow. Yeah. It's and amazing. The mind is a beautiful thing and we control our thoughts, but the body, oh my gosh, it's yeah. a miracle in itself with all the things that will give you warning signs. Yeah. And you went through all these different things, and then you end up having to find stuff that you didn't even know what you were looking for, but it cured yourself and your daughter. Yeah, and I, and I pray a lot, and I get a lot of answers through prayer, um, and, and that was one of them. Mm -hmm. And when I knew we really had it, um, I get really emotional about That's this. Okay. So my daughter was in the second grade by that time, and she had just turned eight and they wanted to take her out of private school because they didn't have programs to support disabilities. Um, this was considered a disability? Mm -hmm. Because she couldn't retain oh, things. Oh, the cognitive, okay. And, um, and I, I said, no, we just, we just found this answer, just give us a little time. Right. And then by the end of the month, the teacher had emailed me and said, Elizabeth is now learning faster than some of the other kids. Wow. And then the next month in February, she came home from school one day and she said, Mommy, this was the best Monday of my life. And I said, why, honey? And she said, because I'm not tired. Oh. She was eight years old and it was the first time that she wasn't tired. To be a kid with all that energy and then she recognizing that, that's beautiful. Yeah, so. And she's, how is she doing now? She's a senior at N NAU. Okay. She had straight A's last semester. Oh, wow. Um, she's on the Dean's List, National Honor Society, and she just got an award for leadership. <gasps> Good for her. Good for you. <laughs> what is her name? Elizabeth. Well, if Elizabeth sees this, yes. good job, Elizabeth. She'll be embarrassed. <laughs> She'll be like, Mom. I'm a mom. <laughs> She's a mom. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah. But miracle, walking miracles, both you and your daughter. Um, before I ask this final question, what inspired you to write this book over my dead body? Obviously, um, you went through this journey, but there's more to it because a lot of people won't think that there's a book to be written. 
Yeah, well, the, the first part of the book is about the near-death experience and uh, my journey through that. Um, I crossed over several times. And I, I have a brother who died t two weeks before his fourth birthday. And when I crossed over, he was there. And I said, oh, you're here to take me to the light. And he said, no, I'm here to tell you it's not your time. Mm -hmm. It's time to go back. And, um, and I didn't want to leave my daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of it is that experience the first part and then the second part goes into everything I discovered about Lyme disease and what worked for us to get well and we've been Lyme free since 2009 I love it so so, so I, I, I you know knowing that it could help millions of people who are suffering from this disease and everybody's um, illness is a little bit different because there's numerous co-infections that you get from the deer uh, the deer tick also so everybody is a little bit differently but I wanted to share what worked for us in hopes that many other people would be able to heal. Now I don't want anyone to get nervous because there's deer tick around wherever you are because ticks are out in the woods we love to go camping go hiking I'm a hiker I'm an avid out na nature kind of person I will be paying more attention but then again you really can't because you don't see it until after the fact. Well, s some of them you do. Okay. Um, the ones that are the primary carriers of Lyme disease look like a little um, spider. And it's expensive to get Lyme disease testing. However, if you find the tick, you can put it in a baggie and take it to a veterinarian. And they test. will test it oh. for a very reasonable minimal price. <laughs> a minimal amount. <laughs> and so if you actually <laughs> find it, you take it to a veterinary clinic because you can get a yes, no on it. Okay, um, so there you have it. Not that I want anyone to be concerned with that, but yes. Where can we find your book? And then um, uh, where can we find you? Should we want to reach out to you or anyone that's seeing this? Well, we, I have a website, um, championforlife.com, where we, the book is available on that website as our many of the supplements that I used to that helped us get well mm -hmm. um, you do have to have a doctor I'm, I'm not a doctor um, to get the antibiotics but some of the supplements and some of the detox because what I learned is with the neurotoxins it's really important to do the detox um, portion of this before and during the treatments um, so that's championforlife.com and it's also available on Amazon Wonderful. Yes. And I'm going to get mine signed today, so I will have mine. Thank you. Okay. Um, my final question, I didn't prep you on this one. This is where I get to find out more about people. If it was the only question I ask and get the answer, I think I get to learn more about someone in that short question versus having the time to sit with them, although I would learn more, but entice me. My question is this. What message would you like to leave everyone based on your journey? Ooh, um, well, there is hope. Yes. Uh, tying it into the name of your show. Thank you. Um, it's a lot of people with Lyme disease are sick for many, many years. A lot of people are misdiagnosed with Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. Um, a lot of the degenerative diseases, neurological diseases, are actually Lyme disease. Mm. And um, like Michael J. Fox actually had Lyme disease. Oh, before we know. And it presented part. as Parkinson's mm -hmm. because there's, you know, neurotoxins. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is hope. There is a way to get well. Um, the co-infection sometimes, but kn knowing that we can do A, B, and C to get rid of the Lyme, sometimes the co-infections are more difficult to get rid of than the Lyme itself now. Hmm. But there's numerous people that have used similar, the same techniques, and, and they're, they're well. Um, doing aerobics, hiking, doing all kinds of things. And, you know, being an extreme skier and loving skiing like I did, you know, the first time I went back up on the mountain and I was skiing with one of my girlfriends and I was bawling. <laughs> and she said, why are you crying? I thought you'd be happy. And I said, I'm crying because I never thought I would be able to do this again. Oh, <laughs> so welcome to your second chance at life. <laughs> yeah. Yes. There, there is hope. And, and that 
and you can have a great life afterwards. Oh, beautiful message. It all comes yeah. back to hope, and it also has to do with your determination, too. Yeah. Thank you for educating me, and if anyone wants to get a hold of Mary Lynn, she's, she's giving you the information, but check out this book as well. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you. Yes. If you have a story you want to share, know someone who has a story, or you have a nonprofit organization in your community that you want spotlighted, please email me to the address of stories at christinehotchkiss.com. And again, I want to thank my studio sponsor, the Motivated Mind Group, your local creative agency. Until next time, everyone, I wish you well, and you take care.